So for today's bass walkthrough, uh, I figured that I'm going to change the album. So I'm going to switch from Pelican West to the Paint and Paint album, and we're going to have a look at the song uh, Prime Time. Now, I suppose I should give you a little bit of a heads up as to what was going on at this point with the band. Nick was pursuing his solo career, and we were still signed, uh, still under contract to BMG, BMG Arista. And they more or less said to us, well, you're a different band now. You don't have your, um, your front man, so you need to go away and come back with some songs that we think are good enough to release. Now, I reckon we could have come back with Bridge Over Troubled Water and they still would have said, oh, I'm not sure about that. I'm not quite sure if it's right, because in my opinion, their plan was not to let us go, not to release anything and just hang on to us. Um, and the reason behind that, I think, was that they wanted to see how Nick's solo career panned out. Because if it all went tits up, then at least they still had everyone under contract and they, they could maybe salvage something from it. But obviously this didn't suit us. It was a little bit like the scenario where you have a Premier League footballer signed and you just sit him on the bench for the whole season just to see how the main striker turns out. But you don't pay him either. So this is what we were doing for a living at this point and we weren't going to earn any money so we needed to get out of the contract. So we went through that whole horrible thing of lawyers and court cases and we weren't allowed to do anything, we weren't allowed to record anything because we were still under contract which would have meant that they owned it. So we just basically had to sit around and wait uh, and go through that whole lawyer press hideous time awful hated it eventually we did get out we had to sell more or less everything about our mothers to do it and we were back to square one and we needed the record deal and luckily Polydor turned up and offered us a deal and I remember the press was particularly nasty to us at that point as well there was the big haircut backlash um, and I remember one of the uh, write-ups I think it was the enemy or the melody maker said something like what were Haircut 100 seen doing going into the back door of Polydor Records with crayons clutched in their sweaty little mitts? Don't tell me they've actually found someone daft enough to sign them and we thought there was a recession on. Now, I think I met up with that journalist or saw him in a club not long after that. And what I should have done really is gone up and punched him in the face. But I'm a really nice person and I'm not a very good puncher. So it's probably best that I didn't. So there we were, new label, we needed to record, record a new album, we didn't have a lead singer, we were auditioning lead singers and although that was absolutely hilarious, um, it didn't really get us anywhere and it wasn't long before we actually realised, well you can't replace Nick Haywood in Haircut 100, you just can't do it. Everyone else we've been looking at is not working out so the only thing we can do is stick with the members that were already there and we needed one of us to sing. And the obvious choice was Mark, because he'd done backing vocals in the studio and live. Now, Mark was really, really reluctant. He didn't want to do it, but there was no other choice, so off we went. And you know what? I think he did a really, really good job. Um, so we went into Jacobs, we started recording this album, the Paint and Paint album. It's a miracle that it got finished, because there was so much stress and so much angst going on. I think that was the first time, really, in the band that we we were arguing and not because we didn't like each other it was just the tension the the pressure to produce and deliver was so great uh, and we were in a situation i think unlike nick who had already done so we kind of needed to prove ourselves halfway through the album blair decided that he would leave so we were without a drummer and just to add a little bit more stress um, luckily we knew some really good session guys and Graham Ward, drummer Graham Ward came in and finished the album and he did a great job too. And talking about great jobs, Graham. Graham was just lumbered with every guitar part, whereas he was sharing it before with Nick. Now the onus, the spotlight was on him and you know what, I think Graham absolutely delivered. He did such an amazing job on that album. Um, and also, I think I was at my peak there as well because we'd done a lot of touring, we played live a lot and we were a very very tight band by then and I think I did some of my best work there and we delivered it under pressure and I think it's a product that I think we can be very proud of and I heard 
from a photographer in New York told us that whenever Diana Ross or Mick Jagger, not Mick Jagger, Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson, Diana Ross or Michael Jackson went into the studio for a photo shoot, they always asked for that album to be put on in the background, background because they really, really loved it. So, poor, you can't get better than that, can you? So, um, yeah, let's have a look at uh, the bass walkthrough for prime time. So let's have a look at the intro. Basically starts on a C, hammers on to a D, and then the resolving note at the end is on an F. So that would be... So that when you go into the first verse, starts on a C, um, and the notes used are the C, the G, to the A, and then hammering on from the C up to the D. And the feel of it is... I'm also putting a grace note every time I go to the G, so it's like a skip. run up which goes from an E on the A string and it's just the octave going up semitones okay and then G C so the whole thing would be And then it resolves by going back to the E to introduce that chorus. There is another thing when it doesn't do the octave thing, it does a little triplet thing, which is and if I dampen the left hand just to show you what the right hand is doing, it's using three fingers on the G string and one on the D. sounds as so that would be okay and then we go to the chorus Chorus starts on an E, so you've gone from and then you go to an E and an F. S uh, D to a C and then you have a run which goes which is again and to finish off the chorus it has to end up on a G so the line to that is uh, so it's the last part of the chorus which does the flam part on the drums and goes back into the Now on to the middle eight. And then we 
have the middle eight. And the middle eight starts on E, goes to F, and it looks like this. A. That would be second time round. Every time it hits a G, it hits an octave as well, either a double or a single. So that would be. That's about it. Not that difficult. 